Um, so next we'll be hearing from Dr. Uh, Denev, who will be talking about uh, details from chapter seven on work and well-being during COVID-19, impact inequalities, resilience, and the future of work. Um, I wonder if you're listening to uh, Richard just now on the important work on well-being and policy. Um, as you might remember from the highlights just now, uh, about an hour ago, um, I've had the privilege and pleasure to work with a stellar young team. And this time around, we have the time to actually name them. Uh, so these are Maria Kotovan at LSE, Martha Golan and Mika Katz at Oxford, and George Ward at MIT Sloan. Uh, and it's a, a superb team of young scholars uh, that, we're, um, that really represent the future of, uh, of empirical science and well-being, if you ask me. We left no stone unturned in looking at the impact of work and well-being um, uh, because of COVID-19. And as Lara noted, we've kind of structured it, structured it between the raw impact, the unequal aspects of the impact, resiliency and what drove resiliency, and then try to come up with lessons for the future of work and how to build back happier. And so I'll, um, I'll start again with impact uh, and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll reiterate some of the insights that have come out um, uh, and discussed uh, an hour ago, but I will develop on those a bit and add quite a bit actually. Um, the first thing to note is the impact uh, on um, uh, rising levels of unemployment. Um, I've mentioned this before, but here there's, there's already quite a bit of impact um, that we've noted as economists around the world. So for example, in the United States, there was five, six, 7% uh, drops in employment rates, that was less for the United Kingdom, one or two percent. A lot here is to be explained by the, the policies that were put in, into play. Um, uh, in the United Kingdom, there was a furlough scheme, which is a job retention package, uh, and that maintained people at work. In the United States, the choice was made for a, an income replacement scheme in case people lost their jobs. So that could help explain differences in employment figures uh, dropping around the world. Now, what we're interested in, in the World Happiness Report, of course, is the impact on well-being. Um, and we all know from the literature just how important work is for well-being. And so we ran the regressions on the 2020 data that we could get our hands on. And as I've noted before, um, it, it is really striking just how important work is, or rather how uh, what a negative impact it has if you're not uh, having a job or being em or employed. Uh, at the time of answering questions about how you feel about the quality of your life. And so the impact ranges between sort of 10 to 30%. Uh, in the United Kingdom, the uh, impact was very big uh, over the past year. It's a bit less, for example, in South Korea. Um, we do know from um, really good work by uh, Andrew Clark and others on a social stigma effect, uh, which, which is that if a lot of people fall unemployed at the same time, that could reduce somewhat uh, or buffer a little bit against the impact of, of this. Maybe there's something to be said for this in the context of some countries uh, where um, if you fell unemployed or were made redundant while a furlough scheme was in place, as is the case for the UK, that percent or two of people that did uh, not benefit from the furlough scheme and were left without work um, may, may have felt it even more strongly. Now, I've noted something else uh, about an hour ago, which is something that I personally find really rather striking and an avenue for future research. Because if you have no job um, at a time of uh, a flourishing economy versus not having a job or being made redundant at a time of a pandemic or another major crisis like the financial crisis 12 years ago, what does that mean? How do these two interact? That is a really interesting question I find and something that I do not think we necessarily have answers to. But what you're seeing in front of you now to really should uh, drive a research agenda in that direction. Um, about 50, per, there was a 50% drop in the supply of jobs, uh, March, April, May. Um, and this was uh, across the board. Um, what does it mean to people's well being if you do not have a job and find yourself in a situation where it's much harder to find a job and regain employment? Um, is that a, a cause of, sort of, um, of less stigma surrounding being unemployed because it's more difficult to find a job? Or does it even increase anxiety because it is more difficult to find a job? These are empirical questions, I think, but ones that are really, really important and that we should try and figure out. So that the, is it, um, does it exacerbate the impact of being made redundant to, do, to be made redundant in a pandemic or a major crisis? Or does it to some extent buffer because everybody else is in the same boat? So those, uh, the important thing here, of course, to note is that jobs have come back, but are still way below where we were 
uh, uh, the same time last year, at the exception, you'll see, of Australia amongst the countries being studied here. And so some of the countries have seen pretty much a full return, if not even above where they were uh, before. Um, inequalities. Uh, it's been mentioned a few times that the impact of COVID has, has um, put a spotlight on different um, heterogeneous impacts and exacerbation also of, of previous and prior inequalities. I think, um, I know this is a busy slide, but I'll, I'll, um, there's three systematic ways in which we've picked up a, a large inequalities essentially being ex exacerbated. The first one is um, there was a huge um, and greater risk of reduced working hours by, for people with low income. So people who um, are, uh, have an equal inequality in income to begin with also saw a greater risk of reduced working hours. So this is what I'd call an exacerbation of, the, of, of existing inequalities. If you look at figure 3b, you also find related and linked to what we just said, uh, a decline in working hours by skill level. I know um, um, uh, it, uh, there's no such thing as low skill and high skill, but the economists sadly still call it that way. And so we had to follow suit. And so what you see here is that the um, decline in working hours was almost double uh, for, um, um, for people that are considered low skill in traditional economic setting. One country here was the exception, that was Norway, where um, so, uh, supposedly low skill uh, uh, workers actually uh, saw, did not see a reduction in working hours, but they're really the exception rather, the rule, rather than the rule. Um, if you move to figure 3C, then you find what I think is perhaps the most um, disturbing of all, which is um, the difference and the, uh, between age groups. So what you see here is the change in employment rate by age. Um, the green dots represent the averages, and you'll see uh, countries sort of averaging minus two, minus three, to minus one, to minus a half percent drop in the unemployment, um, sorry, in the in employment rate, so increase in unemployment. But if you look and zoom in on the youngest uh, workers from 15 to 24, although I do hope they're still in school at the age of 15, um, what you note is it is much, much higher for that, for that group. And anecdotal evidence from speaking to youngsters really um, uh, backs this up in my, in my own modest opinion. Now, where it's a mixed bag is the impact on gender from uh, the, the COVID impact on employment. If you look at it by gender, it's a much, it's a much uh, more uh, mixed bag of results. So um, there's no systematic bias uh, one way or the other, but you'll see some countries like Portugal where men are impacted much more in terms of losing their jobs. And then you have other countries um, where it is uh, women like in Slovenia, where, where uh, they are much more impacted in turn. So there's no general insight to be said about unequal impacts on um, uh, employment status uh, by gender. It really is a mixed bag and dependent on context. However, where there is no question where there was been, has been an impact on um, um, uh, the job status and in turn the well-being is by working mothers. <clears throat> so great work by um, Marta Golan and the team um, here at Oxford have really shown the following in very specific um, um, surveys is that across uh, in the surveys they run in Germany, the UK and the United States, what they find is that for working mothers or working fathers, uh, the time they had to spend on childcare and homeschooling really took up a large chunk of the day. But while men helped out or fathers helped out in homeschooling to more or less the same extent as women did, that was the same cannot be said of childcare where women really took up about 15, 20, 30% more of the childcare duties, even though they too were professionals meant to be working from home. Um, so this may um, then translate into differential well-being impacts as well. Now there's one graph, uh, sorry, before I get into a graph on loneliness, I want to show you the following, uh, which is the unequal impact, uh, which will have been felt in terms of well-being too by industry really rather remarkable how the COVID crisis helped some industries, but mostly did not help others. Um, so for example, the accommodation and food service activities, think hotels, restaurants, and cafes, um, were, saw the biggest drops in employment. Um, partially, this will link back to younger individuals that we saw earlier, because those are mostly younger people serving in those industries. So there's some correlations between these inequalities or links 
uh, that I've just been describing. Um, and then other industries, including information and communication, perhaps not surprising, and public administration, where people did not lose their jobs. In fact, there was a slight uptick uh, in employment. So again, some people, I mean, the COVID uh, disease hits everybody, but the impact on the job market was very much heterogeneous and hugely unequal. Um, this, I personally found a, a highlight in terms of insights, and we've raised it earlier on in the highlight session. I'll just briefly mention it here again. This is thanks to Daisy Fancourt and the UCL team and the UCL COVID-19 social study, where they've tracked uh, people over time on a week to week basis. And here, what you see is essentially the weeks before and after uh, having to stop work. This is either being made redundant or being put on a furlough scheme. Uh, a number of combinations are possible. But what's interesting is, is that here we look and split it between people that are self-reported to be lonely, according to the UCL, uh, sorry, UCLA loneliness scale, the three-point uh, three Likert scale. And what you find here is that people that do not have social support to begin with, especially in a time of a pandemic with social distancing rules in place, were hit much, much harder than were people who did have social support outside of the workplace. Uh, and that is, I think, something very important to note. Uh, and loneliness has come up and deserves a lot of attention, especially uh, in this pandemic. Now, on to resilience. Uh, what I haven't mentioned yet in the highlights section, but I really want to emphasize here, is that the first source of resilience was through policy. I really want you to take a close look at the following. Um, this is, again, UK data, but um, I, I'm, um, I am confident it, it travels outside of the UK with other places that saw strong job retention schemes in place. What you're seeing here, again, is week to week um, sense of life satisfaction, the changes in life satisfaction from week to week in the weeks before having to stop work versus uh, in following uh, st work stoppage. But split between people who benefit from a furlough scheme, um, a job retention scheme, uh, without income loss, with some income loss, probably 20%, as was the case in the UK. And then the dark blue line is essentially people who do not benefit from a job retention scheme when they're being laid off. Uh, and they, as a result, also have income loss. The differences are stark and almost too good to be true from a, from a data perspective. Look at the point of actually having to stop work. One is a drop of 5%. The other one is a drop of 10%. The other one is a drop of 15% in life satisfaction. So the first source of resilience really, if I may say so, is due to good policymaking. And in the chapter, we delve and dig into this a little bit where we find that um, uh, or, make, uh, or look into and study those countries with uh, generous job retention schemes like the UK, like the Kurzarbeit scheme in Germany versus those countries whose policy was more focused on simply income replacement. And like was the case in the United States where um, uh, checks were sent out um, uh, to try and recover lost income, but no job retention schemes were put in place. Uh, and as we know from the well-being literature, jobs are more than income. Jobs are both uh, social identity, social status, social network, and uh, a routine throughout your day. And the, uh, the non-pecuniary aspects of a job uh, are probably as important as the pecuniary aspects. So this is an important lesson to be learned uh, moving forward uh, for policymakers, I would argue. Now, um, if we look more dynamically over time, um, um, thanks in this case to the UK YouGov weekly tracker, and we see um, uh, aspects of this in, in other trackers as well. Um, and this may be somewhat counterintuitive to some of you, which is that the biggest drop came right before the lockdowns. So um, late February, March, uh, is when the big drops in, uh, in this case, happiness were, show, were felt. Um, it may seem like a long time ago, but those in the UK will remember, this is a time that we, we all went hoarding toilet paper. Um, luckily, um, lockdown came uh, and, well, uh, and that, uh, brought a new normal and, gov and, um, and regulations, as well as uh, a new way of working and interacting with one another. So people had a sense of psychological stability. Most importantly, of course, was the furlough scheme was introduced. And you'll see this in the United States as well on the next slide, just how important these job, uh, I mean, the, the, these, these financial packages were job, whether they were job retention or income replacement. Um, 
Now, while um, society, whether you're a blue collar or a white collar worker, um, recovered slightly uh, and a gradual recovery towards the summer, we never fully recovered. So today, especially, we're still way lower than we normally are in, in a traditional, more normal non-pandemic year. Uh, but there was some recovery and then again a drop as people were worn out by the pandemic. Now, thanks to our um, fabulous uh, data partner, Indeed, um, we also have even more granular data uh, for the United States. The story is somewhat similar, uh, but, but, um, but slightly different nonetheless, partially because of the nature of the data. What you're seeing here is again, the um, slight drop in this case, uh, in terms of work happiness. So this is happiness for, uh, by workers, self-reported uh, in a crowdsourced manner, uh, thanks to Indeed. And we're now up to close to 5 million uh, data points on this front. So this is large, uh, this is quickly becoming the largest data set on employee happiness in the world, and it's still growing. Um, so what you're seeing here is a drop in work happiness as, as the pandemic uh, uh, starts uh, raising anxieties, uh, an increase, uh, a sense of relief, and even an increase in workplace happiness when all these government measures come into play. Now here, unlike the graph before, the increase may sound or look a bit awkward. In part, this is because we're only measuring those that have remained in work. As you will have remembered, in the United States, a lot of people lost their work, and that was mostly targeting or was mostly the case for people that um, um, uh, lower skill, lower income type jobs who are uh, less happy to begin with. So there's a mechanical aspect to this bump. But the most important lesson, of course, is following uh, all, all these measures. Over the summer and into the fall, uh, workplace happiness kept falling and falling, and now has reached a level that is well below uh, where it started uh, at the same time last year. And so people are less happy today than they were last year uh, in their workplaces because of the pandemic. Um, one other aspect before I move towards concluding is uh, the, the insights that from Indeed on the workplace drivers. Um, I've mentioned this in the, in, uh, in, the, in the general insights session earlier today, but I want to repeat here what we found. Um, Indeed surveys workplace happiness, but there's more than that. It also surveys a whole series of interesting drivers uh, of what it, what, and it allows us to then um, reverse engineer to see what is it that's really driving people's workplace well-being. And uh, for economists, this may sound surprising, but it isn't um, pay. Uh, so pay only sits in the middle of the pack in terms of explaining job happiness. The drivers that really come out and are revealed to be the most important ones in driving one's workplace happiness really are the social ones, the social capital ones, and in particular, a sense of belonging uh, in your firm. That means good quality relationships, having friends at work and feeling a sense of belonging more generally. Uh, flexibility was important before and became slightly more important uh, during. Now, um, one lesson to learn here is the stability of these drivers. Um, so while there's some movements, they're mostly stable. So that means that companies that were doing well in terms of having the right dimensions in place and fostering the social aspects and the flexibility aspects of their jobs that they offer to their workers before the pandemic will have continued to do better and will have had their employees cope better during the pandemic. Um, and then finally, if you look uh, carefully, you'll see some movement in the months following the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. And you'll see that belonging became even more important uh, that flexibility had its moment as well in March and April, uh, and that this managerial support became a lot more important than where it usually sits uh, during the pandemic. So these are some uh, basic insights, thanks to the very rich data set that Indeed is compiling and that we've had the pleasure and benefit of being able to use. Um, and uh, let me conclude on a few lessons on the future of work and how to build back happier. Um, and the first thing to note is just the importance of work and employment generally, and not just for the pecuniary aspects, but especially for the non-pecuniary aspects. A lesson for the future of uh, for the future generally is for policymakers: can we make these furlough schemes a more stable aspect of the policy menu moving forward? rather than having to invent something from scratch, it was, as was the case in the UK, can we move towards a more stable policy um, 
tool um, such as they have, such as the one that they have in Germany? And can that perhaps be replicated elsewhere? A second, more disturbing question to some extent is, and thanks to the great work of one of, of, one of our co-authors, is past crises have sometimes shifted the longer term expectations and work values of the younger generation that comes to, that moves into the workplace at about this time. So there is a um, potentiality that the people graduating now into this very difficult um, work environment with very few jobs available will be looking more for job security and financial security uh, as compared to more purpose-driven jobs. Uh, so that is a question mark and something that will need to be studied. Now, perhaps, and finally, the most salient aspect of this entire COVID-19 pandemic's impact on the world of work is probably the adoption of the technology to be able to work remotely. Now, before the pandemic, 5% of people were working from home and using those technologies. At the height of the first lockdown, 50% of people were working from home. We're now at about 20, 25%, and McKinsey estimates that we can probably stay at about 15 to 20% moving forward. So a big question that people in the workplace are now dealing with is to what extent is it a good or a bad idea to um, work from home versus work from the office? Um, from a well-being perspective, I think we've got some lessons to, uh, or insights that we can bring to the table and can hopefully shape that future of work. The first one is that there's, there's real benefits to working from home, including greater flexibility and less commuting. And we all know from the, the old studies in well-being how bad commuting is typically for one's well-being. I would like to add also that less commuting raises more purchasing power because commuting tends to be expensive for many people. And so that raises uh, purchasing power and also helps well-being a bit in the margins. But I would argue, and we discussed this at length, that working from home, especially if we ditch the office altogether, uh, which, is, which, which is what some companies are suggesting, we risk eroding social and intellectual capital. And as we've just seen, a sense of belonging and quality social relations are absolutely critical for workplace well-being. And so by if we were to move the needle too much towards working from home, we will be eroding that social capital. And social and intellectual capital require inflows of people, places, and ideas. Uh, and that will remain critical moving forward. So a lesson for the future of work would be to move towards a system that has the best of both worlds. In other words, a hybrid um, system that is coordinated between workers. So let me leave it at that. And if Janine Ptolemeo is available, I would uh, very much appreciate if she can join us for a minute or two to give she her is. impressions of the amazing data set that Indeed is compiling. <clears throat> Thanks, Jan. Hi, everyone. I'm Janine, and I'm the Work Happiness Score uh, Marketing Lead at Indeed. I'm just going to take a few minutes to share why Indeed is talking about work happiness, what the Work Happiness Score is, and how some of the work well-being dimensions that Jan mentioned have really surprised us this past year. So Indeed's mission is to help people get jobs, and we have so many teams working on solving big issues like black hole in application, reducing biases in hiring, getting people back to work faster, and so much more. I'm really lucky to work on a very small but mighty team that has the opportunity to explore how Indeed can actually help people, people have greater well-being at work. A few years ago, my colleagues and I started to ask, what does it mean to really be a great workplace today? And how can we help people get closer to a good life through work? After all, we know that a third of our lives are spent at work on average, and that work is critically important to provide for ourselves, our families, um, financially, as well as that sense of dignity and meaning. We have 250 million job seekers that use Indeed each month. So we knew we had a big opportunity to make a difference here. And through our research, we learned that things like fair pay and flexibility are absolute requirements, table stakes in fact, but people are really looking to their workplaces to offer them more. More belonging, trust, inclusion, appreciation, a sense of purpose, these are all things that contribute to our well-being at work. So we began to collect and showcase that data from employees all around the world so that people can understand and compare companies on this important measurement. We're so lucky to have been guided by experts like Jan and Sonia in both our question design and the analysis of some of our data. Uh, in a little over a year, we've collected over 5 million happiness surveys from Indeed users 
and that data collection is ongoing every single day. So these insights are publicly displayed on Indeed, company by company, for job seekers to use in their decision-making process and for employers to understand how their workforce is actually feeling. Lastly, one of the biggest learnings that surprised me this year is really how helpful these dimensions have been for both people and companies. They've given us a, a bit of a vocabulary and an understanding of some of the new levers that we can actually use to understand how we're feeling at work, especially in a year that had so many ups and downs. Um, for belonging, uh, or for rather for most companies across Indeed, belonging is actually one of the lowest scoring attributes across the board. But like Jan mentioned, that is actually one of the biggest drivers of well being at work. So we're thrilled to be able to provide this level of transparency. And really, we're just getting started. We know that of all the dimensions we have, we can look at that by job title, by location, by different income groups, education. And we really just scrape the surface on what we can do to provide more transparency for both job seekers and employers. Lastly, I wanted to, since it is International Day of Happiness, leave everyone with one of my favorite quotes that has been kind of a spirit guide for our team throughout this work. It's from the author, Annie Dillard, and she says, how we spend our days is, of course, how we spend our lives. Thank you. And thanks, Jan. Thank you, Thank you Janine. very much, Jan and Janine. Um, we have a couple questions that have come in through the Q&A. I don't think we'll be able to get to all of them, but I will try to guide us through one or two before we have to switch. Um, one of the first questions comes from Nancy Hay. The question is, does the social support for unemployed, for the unemployed increase the likelihood of reemployment or just protect from the impact of unemployment? Uh, thank you, Lara, and especially thank you, Nancy, for such a great question. Um, it would be interesting to see, and I'm not familiar with any particular research that studies this, but intuition would say that on the one hand, well, sorry, what we do know, obviously it buffers against the impact of falling unemployed. So uh, having a social support structure outside of work helps you in case you're being made redundant. But I see Nancy's point, which is if you have that social support network, you're also much more likely to perhaps regain a job. And I couldn't agree more with that um, because even though in the era of Indeed and being able to uh, quite easily submit your CVs left and right, it's still social connections that get you that foot in the door and get the interview in the first place. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if uh, not being lonely, in other words, having a social support structure outside of work will also be critical in regaining employment. Thank you. We have another question from Vanessa King, who asks, how are the self-employed or those that uh, those on zero hour contracts reflected in your data, especially in figure 3A? We um, don't talk much about it in the chapter, I'm afraid. We have one um, uh, analysis on this front, but more needs to be done. Um, what came out of that is that the self-employed have been hit harder than the employed, um, in part because they were less likely to benefit from these job, job retention or even income, well, income replacement schemes they did, but these job retention schemes applied much less to them. And governments were much slower to act on aspects of um, self-employed and uh, um, ways of helping and, 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 and helping them uh, get them support that they needed. Um, so generally speaking, we know from the workplace and work and well-being literature that the self-employed have an interesting relationship with well-being. On the one hand, they tend to be uh, more satisfied with their lives because probably they have a, more of, a, of a, a sense of agency in what they actually do, even a greater sense of purpose. But on the other hand, we find on the emotional affective measures, we find the self-employed to be slightly more anxious and stressed or worried, which comes together, of course, or goes hand in hand with the fact that self-employed also have their own or have uh, are more vulnerable to uh, aspects happening. Good, so I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Lara. 